series of guardrails uh, that we did in 2015. And I think it's very important. It's one of those series you want to do every few years because it's such an important part of our life to understand the whole concept of what a guardrail is and how it relates to our lives. And guardrails are really, really important. And I know there was a time I was probably 20, 21 years of age, and I was driving down the 401. I was returning home from work, and it was a really sunny day, and, and, and I didn't have my glasses, and, I, and it, I was just, the sun was beating down. I had worked all day, and I was tired. How many have been there? And I found myself, myself uh, struggling to keep my eyes open, okay? I'm a young driver here, and I'm like, I'm dozing in and off, and I'm slapping myself. And, you know, I don't know if anyone have, has experienced that before. Uh, you're doing this, you know, trying to stay awake. But what happened was instead of pulling over, I was foolish. I continued to drive, and I fell asleep. And I woke up abruptly as I hit a guardrail on the 401, going along the 401. All of a sudden, um, I had a, a sporty car with wide tires, came out past the the fender of the car, and I don't know if you know those, uh, the guardrails, the concrete ones, they come down, they've got a little angle at the bottom, right, to help them stand. Well, that angle is not only to help them stand, but it's, it's to allow your tire to hit the, that before you hit the car. And so I'm driving, and, and all, all of a sudden, I'm bam, and I'm hitting, and I open my eyes up, and I pull back, and I, I realize that that guardrail saved my life, and that guardrail saved the life of possibly people on the other side coming the other way. And so guardrails are important. And just like we have guardrails in the natural, we need them also spiritually in our lives. Okay? And so what is a guardrail? And we'll bring up our PowerPoints, please. A guardrail is a system designed to keep vehicles from straying into dangerous off-limit areas. Okay? A guardrail is a system designed to keep Vehicles from straying into dangerous off-limit areas. Guardrails are found in the most potentially dangerous areas of the road. The three most common places are bridges. Because, you know, when you're going over a bridge, there's little room for error. If you go off the road, I mean, it's not a, it's not a pretty sight. Um, medians to, to protect you from ongoing traffic. And, of course, soft shoulders, curves, and unexpected changes. And so guardrails are important. Say guardrails are important. Amen. Awesome. Do we not have our PowerPoints? Okay, but they're not. Just hit slideshow, the second one down, and it will pop it up right here. Okay? Just use the PowerPoint because we're having problems with ProPresenter. So. Um, but anyway, let's move on. So what can we learn from guardrails? Number, here's the thing. They, they direct and they protect. There's two, two, two purposes of guardrails. They direct you, but they also protect you. Uh, there's something interested about, interesting about the placement of guardrails. They're, they're actually not placed in the actual danger, uh, the areas of, of danger. They're placed before the danger zone. All right? And, and um, they're placed just inside the danger zone. The actual danger zones are just beyond where the guardrails are. Okay? And um, one of the things is just a few weeks ago, my, my, uh, my children and I, we went, we went to visit my brother in Stony Creek, and we went out to this place called Beamer Conservation Area. I don't know if you've been there, um, but it's, it's a lookout for eagles. And it, it, there's, a, there's this, this cliff that goes all the way around the Niagara, Niagara there. It's a big cliff. And uh, we, went, we went walking and hiking. And so I was cool. I had all my kids, and we were excited, and we're walking. And the next thing you know, we get to this place where there's this pathway that follows the cliff. And it's literally like here, you're walking along this pathway here, and, and there's, there, you're looking down, and it's 100 to 300 feet in different areas, straight down. And they have no guardrails. And I'm not afraid of heights, but when you have all your kids, that's another story, right? And so I, I was a nervous wreck. My brother said, you're a nervous wreck, because I was watching the kids, and here's the kids walking along the edge. La, 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 la. And, and there's like roots coming out and stuff. And I'm just, I'm thinking to myself, it's just a trip or, and then my daughter, Hannah, she's like, hey, dad, look, you know, I'm like, don't do that. I'm like crawling out of my skin, I'm walking with the kids, right? And I'm just like, I'm running ahead. Slow down, guys. You need to stay with. And, and my brother's like, you got, you got to calm down. But there was no guardrails. And there was a few places where there were guardrails. And that, those are the places I liked, right? But many places didn't have guardrails. And, uh, you know, guardrails are, are there to protect you from the danger zones that are just beyond. How many hear what I'm saying? Okay. And um, 
The assumption with guardrails is that the damage done by hitting a guardrail is minor. We're on slide three. Uh, minor when compared to what would have happened if the guardrail had not been there. Okay? And that's, that's the thing is the guardrail can do some damage if you hit it. I had an alignment issue with my car after that. But how many know that little issue and that little expense that you know, I had to fix that was not a big deal compared to what would have been there if that, 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 that guardrail was not there. I would have had more issues. Okay? And so guardrails are designed to alert our conscience. When we, when we design guardrails in our life, it, it's a con, it, it alerts our conscience that there's danger on the other side. And so we, we have to set up guardrails. Okay? And so if you, if you bump up against any of these guardrails that you've established, your conscience will be triggered and you'll, and you'll come back onto the road. Does that make sense? And so your greatest regrets could have probably been avoided if you had had some financial, some moral, some relational, some professional guardrails, all right? Even guardrails for your health, guardrails for your time. How many know what I'm talking about? And we can all think back about times where, you know, I wish I wouldn't have spent so much time with these people, or I wouldn't have done this, or I sh wouldn't have taken that job. I wasted time, and I fell into areas I shouldn't, I did things I shouldn't have did. Why? Because you didn't have guardrails. And so guardrails are important. And the problem is, the challenge today is that our culture doesn't promote it, right? Whatever you want to do, go ahead and do it. It's fine. But guardrails are important, all right? Very important. You know, we talk about guardrails with sexuality. We talk about sex. And, uh, you know, there's a painted line in the world system. They don't worry about guardrails, just a painted line. You can go over it. You won't get hurt. But here's the thing, you know, some people will say, you know, wait until you're ready, okay? But what does that mean, wait till you're ready? What does it mean to wait till you're ready, okay? For some people, it means wait until you're married, wait until you get to the corner store and buy a, a condoms, wait until, you know, uh, you know, wait until you know each other good enough, you got to date at least three months, and then you can be together. But the biblical definition or guardrail is wait till you're married. How, how many hear what I'm saying? All right, but people have different definitions of what it means to wait till you're ready, all right? Um, so we need to find out what the Bible says, and we have to build our guardrails based on what the Scripture says. How, how many hear what I'm saying? Because the world has a different idea of where you should place your guardrails, okay? And so the problem with all of these different things is that uh, these things do not alert your conscience. You have to have a biblical guardrail in your life, okay? This is not a new idea, this whole guardrail thing. It's both in the Old Testament, uh, the New Testament addressed the issue. They didn't use the term guardrail. Abraham didn't look at Sarah and say, slow down, the donkey might hit the guardrail. And the, they didn't have guardrails because they weren't going fast enough to worry about them. But we understand the concept of guardrails, correct? In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8 to 14, for once you were full of darkness, okay, but now you have light in the Lord, so live as people of light, for the light within you produces only what is good, right, and true. So the light of God in you produces what's right and true and good. Say, the light produces goodness. Okay, and we're talking about the Holy Spirit. We're talking about the light of life. We're talking about Jesus, all right? So you have the Holy Spirit. You're going to live a good life. You're, it's going to produce good things in your life, okay? But it says here, in verse 10, carefully determine what pleases the Lord. So just because the light is in you, you still have to carefully determine, does this please the Lord or does this not please the Lord? Okay? That's what the scripture is saying. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. All right? It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. But their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. For the light makes everything visible. So when you get around people that don't, and you have the light of Christ in you, sometimes they persecute you because the light is exposing darkness in them, right? That's why Jesus says, it's not good if everyone thinks good of you and everyone can hang out with you because that means the light's not shining bright. How many hear what I'm saying? Okay, and so for the light makes everything visible, this is why it is said, and here's a good verse. We just got baptized, some of us, the other day, right? Awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. 
right? And so you rose from the dead. You were buried with Christ in baptism. You rose in newness of life, right? So now the power of God is in you so the light can shine and produce in you good things. Say, say the light produces good things. All right? But let's keep reading here. And it's important to understand that this is a picture of baptism in a sense. You're buried with Christ. You're raised in newness of life. Okay? But understand this. Jesus came. He was baptized by John. He arose out of the water. And the Bible says immediately the Spirit of the Lord descended upon him. Right? In the form of a dove. How how many remember that? And so when you get baptized and when you get saved, really, the Spirit of God comes and descends upon you. Amen? So you're empowered with the light. So you have it. But immediately, Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Because when you're baptized, it's kind of like your funeral service. And you get to resurrect from this funeral service. It's great. Come up in newness of life. And the enemy comes and says, I'm going to really test and see if if they're really committed. And then sometimes some of the greatest temptations come right after you're baptized. Did you know that? It just happens. All right? And so, so, so this is what... So it's a picture... Jesus comes up, the Spirit of God comes, and then he's led into the, in, in, into the wilderness. So there's this great picture. In Acts chapter 19, verse 5 to 6, it says, the, uh, we had the believers in Ephesus. It says, as soon as they heard this, they heard the message of Jesus. They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied, okay? And so I'm saying all this to say, as believers, we have the power. Say, we have the power. We have the power. Remember? No, never mind. It was an old song. Um, We have the power in the spirit to walk with character and integrity. We have the power, but we have to make choices. We have to set up guardrails because we're not invincible and we can be tempted by the devil. Just because you're saved and you're empowered by God and you're not going to be a slave to sin, you're still going to be tempted by the enemy. How many have been tempted by the enemy since you said yes to Jesus, right? And so, here's the context. Paul had just finished in Ephesians chapter 4, okay, uh, warning against a series of things that we were generally were against as believers, and that is greed, marriage wrecking, and morality, dishonesty. He warns of the natural, the unnatural consequences of living a lifestyle of sin and living in these behaviors, okay? And, and we understand all this. But let's look at Ephesians chapter 5, this is our next slide, verse 15 to 18. So he's saying all of these things, you know, you can't do all these things, they're evil, they're wrong, but don't worry, you have the Spirit of God, you have light in you, so you have victory. But then he says here in chapter 5, he says, but be very careful, say very careful, how you live. Literally means to look out uh, carefully how you walk or how you step. Be careful where you step. You know what? When we lived in Mississauga, we had this dog named Fluffy. And Fluffy was a little Pekingese poodle. And we said to mom and dad, you know, get us another dog and we'll walk the dog, right? That's always the agreement between the parents and the kid. We'll get you a dog, but you've got to feed it. You've got to take care of it and all this. So we didn't say how we would walk it, which is we'll let itself walk. Um, so we would open the back door and Fluffy would go out the door and then Fluffy would run around and we'd shut the door and then she'd come up and scratch on the door. Some of you have dogs, you know, and we'd let the dog in. The problem is we had this thing in our backyard. We had all these green patches and we had this fertilized. How many know what I'm talking about? You have a good green. So you know where not to step. But sometimes you'd come out in the backyard, you'd be talking to somebody, you'd be like, yeah, and I was, oh no, right? And sometimes you didn't notice until later. You're with your friends, and they're like, somebody stepped on something, you know? Or, you know. And the biggest issue was sometimes coming back into the house, if you didn't recognize, we had beige carpet going from the living room to the kitchen. I don't even want to talk about what happens there. But it's messy, right? And this is what Paul is talking about. Be careful. Look around where you're walking. You, so many Christians are so careless, I'll just go here, I'll do this, I'll hang out with this person. It won't affect me, I'm okay, I'm okay. And they're stepping all over a doo-doo. And they're going to carry it, and they're going to stain someone else's life. Anyone hear what I'm saying here? All right? Be very careful. This is what Paul is saying. Be careful then how you live. Look out where you're stepping. Be careful. 
Don't be careless. Just because you're in power, just because the Spirit of God is in you and you're no longer a slave to sin, be careful because once you enter into relationship with Jesus, you also enter into relationship with the devil. No one likes to hear that. Now, it's not a healthy relationship. It's a it's this kind of relationship. But before you were saved, you were, you were a slave of the enemy, right? So he had you, he, the, the Bible says your eyes are darkened. He's got you in bondage. You don't even realize. But when you get saved, Jesus becomes Lord and he becomes your enemy. And now you are living a life that's, def- he, he, Jesus already defeated the enemy, but now you're living a life to help publicize and make known his defeat. And he doesn't like you. So if he has, he's going to come and try to tempt you. How many hear what I'm saying? So you need to be aware, be careful how you walk because the enemy is your adversary now. Very, very simple. Okay? And look what it says here. Verse 15. Be careful how you walk then, right, where you step. Not as unwise, but as wise, which means with your eyes wide open. Okay? Making the most of every opportunity, literally redeeming the time. The older we get, the more we wish we could go back and Reuse some of our misspent time. How many would agree? You know, I'm only 44, but I think back and say, I wish I would have did this, and I wish I would have. And we, we do that, right? All right? Um, so, so because why? Paul says, because the days are evil, there's dangerous times, you can't afford to be careless. There's too much at stake. And if you're careless, it can cost you something. Okay? How many would agree that we live in dangerous times? financially, morally, relationally, professionally, right? We live in dangerous times. And that's why it's important that we develop guardrails, okay? Are you experiencing some unexpected curves in the road? When you do, you have less margin for error. You have less reaction time, okay? So look what Paul says in verse 17. Therefore, say therefore, Do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is, okay? We have to face up. We need to quit deceiving ourselves. We have to look and say, what is God's will? What does God want from me, okay? And and you, you have to be aware that you could be dancing on the cliff edge and not being careful. And that's why I was so nervous with my kids because I understood the danger and maybe some of the, not my older kids, but the younger ones are just kind of like skipping and talking and playing and and that can be dangerous, but you need to be careful. This is what Paul is speaking about. Okay? Therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Okay? And he says here, he gives some instruction or an illustration in verse 18, which leads to another. He says in verse 18, do not get drunk on wine. This is an illustration. Don't get drunk on wine. Look what he says. Which leads to debauchery. You know, um, I don't want you to miss the point. Of, like, we've been talking about what debauchery is, but I don't want you to miss the point of what Paul is saying, okay? Getting drunk isn't the whole problem. It's part of the problem. But what's the real problem is, the bigger problem is what drunkenness leads to. And Paul is giving an example here. He says, debauchery means extreme indulgences that result in the loss of control, okay? Leading to inappropriate behavior, and it can be alcohol, You can be drunk on alcohol. You can be drunk on lust. You can be drunk on greed. You can be drunk on on, on social media. You give yourself over to something and it affects you to such a point that you lose control. How many hear what I'm saying? So what do we do? We put guardrails in place to keep us from losing control and letting something else control you. Guardrails are important. But look what Paul says in verse 18. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, the issue has to be influence. What's influencing you? Let the Holy Spirit influence you. Okay, Who or what will allow you to influence your behavior and your decisions? What are you allowing to influence you? Do you hear where he's coming with this? And he's saying it's very important that you be filled with the Spirit. You don't want to be filled with alcohol. You don't want to be filled with lust. You don't want to be filled with greed. You don't want to be filled with all of these other things. Jesus wants to be the influencer in your life. Right? God wants to play that role no matter what. He wants to be the one to touch your life. And I, I was just greeting Phil this morning. He came up and says, Pastor, I'm drunk. I said, what? He said, I'm drunk in the spirit. I'm so full of God's presence. And that's where we want to be. We want to be a place where God's presence actually 
alters our state so our state is joy, happiness, and peace in the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. So here's some food for thought. We don't plan to mess up our lives any more than we plan to wreck our cars. We don't. Nobody plans financial ruin through debt. No one plans, uh, hey, I want to have a violent marriage one day. That'd be really great. <laughs> like nobody, plan, nobody plans to get involved with a married man or woman. Nobody plans these things. Nobody plans, plans to fall in love with someone who lacks character, has bad habits. Nobody plans to become addicted to anything. It's not a, you don't sit there and plan, hey, I want to do this, I want to do that. You don't plan these things. We don't plan these things. But what we don't do is we don't plan not to. In other words, guardrails are how we plan not to. When you put a guardrail up, you say, this is my plan not to fall into sin. This is the plan, this is the guardrail that's going to keep me from going into the danger zone. Guardrails are important. And don't insult yourself by saying, I have faith in God. God will take care of me. I've heard that all the time. Yeah, God will take care of me. I don't have to worry about that. No, you're insulting yourself. You have to be wise. You have to watch where you're stepping. You have to set up guardrails in your life. God is trying to help you. um, and, And he's trying to warn us to be careful. How many hear what I'm saying? And so... um. You have to make, do, so let me, give you, let, let, let me give, give you an idea here. So guardrails aren't sin, but guardrails alert your conscience before you sin. Does that make sense? I'll give you an example for that. Uh, some people say, well, I'll never commit adultery. I'll never cheat on my spouse. But then they have no guardrails, and the next thing you know, they wake up in someone else's bed. You say, well, how did I get here? Oh, I feel so guilty. This isn't right. Well, how, I would rather my conscience be triggered before I end up in in that place. So a guardrail, to give you an example, um, for me, I'll give you an example. Um, I won't counsel or minister to a woman alone. I have an open door policy. And if, someone, if a woman walks into my door and sh- uh, office and shuts the door, my conscience goes crazy. I'm like, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Because I've trained the, the conscience to kick in before it's sin. And even if I'm not attracted to the, the woman, I'm thinking, this is wrong, and let's open the door, let's make sure somebody else is here, that kind of thing. How many hear what I'm saying? That's where I've trained myself. And I trained myself also, uh, I won't drive alone, um, drive alone with, with a woman in, in the car. Because when I was younger, when I finished Bible school, there was a youth pastor and his wife, and the young adult pastor and his wife, and they were really good buddies even before they all got married and hooked up. They were all good friends. They grew up together. And one day they swapped cars. They were going on a trip. So the youth pastor had the, the junior high's wife in the car with him and, they, and the other way. And it just was really awkward. And they pulled up and everybody was thinking, is there something going on? And there wasn't. They were innocent. They, were just, they weren't even thinking about it. But everybody else started saying, this is weird. And see how the enemy automatically had a doorway to plant seeds into people's hearts. How many hear what I'm saying? And so I said, you know, I'll never do that. And just a few weeks ago, my, my brother was here from Sweden, and um, his girlfriend, they're not, they're not serving the Lord yet, so they're not married, but they've been together for, what, 11 years, uh, something like that. But anyway, so um, totally would never, I see her as my little sister, I totally would not be attracted to her in any way, but I was going to Walmart, she goes, I want to go to Walmart, she jumped in the car with me, and we're heading to Walmart, and my conscience is going crazy. I'm thinking, oh, this is really odd because I've trained myself not to be alone with a woman in a car. So the chances of me falling into adultery, it would be much, much harder for me to do that because my conscience goes crazy at this level, at the guardrail level. Do you, do you hear what I'm saying? I'm just trying to give you something real here. Um, so I've trained myself that way. My conscience comes and kicks in. And so you need to have guardrails in your life and it might look different for you. You might have to have a guard in your life that, hey, listen, you know, if I'm at somebody else's house and alcohol comes out, hey, I love you, bro, but I'm going home. If you want to visit, if you want to be my friend, you can come to my home where there's no alcohol. How many hear what I'm saying? You have to set guardrails in your life to protect you from the danger zone. Um, altar ministry time. I'll minister to anyone who comes for prayer. If a woman comes to prayer who's not old enough to be my mother, and she starts talking to me about 
you know, how her husband's not there for her or her boyfriend's not there and they, I need your help and support, Pastor. I'll say, you know what, I, I'll pray with you, but I'm going to have this woman here. I'll go grab Deborah or Marilyn and say, would you pray with this woman, please? Why? Because I don't want to be to her what her husband isn't because then I'm creating an issue for her and the danger zone's on the other side. Do you hear what I'm saying? So you have to set up guardrails in your life. And as we go through this series in the next three weeks or so, We'll give you tons of examples of how to do that, okay? But the, here's the added benefit to guardrails. Guardrails not only protect, they also direct. They direct you. And this is one of the things that made me really edgy when I was at the cliffs. Because my kids were walking along, and they're talking, and they're looking at each other. And what would happen is the cliff would veer in like this all over the place. So if they're not watching where they're stepping, they could fall off the cliff because the path moves around the edges. But how many know if you have a guardrail, you don't have to focus on the danger zone. You just walk and you focus on your relationship with Jesus and you follow the guardrail without thinking about the danger zone. Too many Christians are thinking about the danger zone. Oh, I don't want to fall. I don't want to sin. If you have guardrails, your focus is on Jesus. Your guardrails are there. You don't have to think about the danger zone. Because it's, how many hear what I'm saying? Your peripheral vision picks up the guardrail as you walk. And you can look miles ahead and you can see where you have to walk. And you can focus on your relationships instead of the danger zone. I couldn't focus on talking and, hey, how, how was your day at work, bro? You know, how are your kids? I couldn't focus on relationship because I was focused on the danger because there was no guardrails. And if you don't have guardrails in your life... You have nothing to guide you, and then you start saying, oh, I don't want to fall, I don't want to fall, and then you're not focused on relationships. Does that make sense? So guardrails are important. We have to realize guardrails are not sin. Guardrails is placed there in order to keep you from sinning and in order to keep you from falling. All right? So... I think we're going to call it quits here and just, uh, you guys get something out of this today? Go ahead. Can I add something? Um, Travis has said that he likes to tag team, so sometimes I'll get a little thought and I'll add it on. But one thing that we had learned that I thought was so helpful is that to remember, too, that there's a difference between sin and temptation. You know, just because you have temptation doesn't mean that you have sinned. And I think the enemy many times gets us there with guilt and, you know, like somebody said, you can't hinder a bird from flying over your head, but you can hinder it from building a nest in your hair. So you're going to get you're going to get temptation. We all do. And none of us sometimes want to talk about that because we think, oh, you know, and we almost feel like it's, the enemy almost comes to say you've already sinned. But it's not true. So if you if you can get that revelation that sin and temptation is different, you know, that the temptation come. But it's um, somebody I think it was a Bible school teacher said that uh, the level of your maturity is not. Uh, it, it is more dependent on how fast you obey, how fast you respond when God speaks. It's your obedience. So if we can train ourselves to, when we hear that little voice of God, to not delay and kick against and walk in rebellion, but we, okay. You know, because God will guide you. Because you might say, well, how am I going to know all these guardrails or boundaries? I mean, the Holy Spirit is there to help us. So you, you're not alone, you know. Like, we, we can help each other, but ultimately, God wants to help you. Right? So it's, it's important to remember that, I think. And God wants us to be safe, and God wants us to stay out of the danger zone. Because how many know that sin is des deceitful? It'll take you farther than you want to go, and it looks, it's, 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 it's candy-coated. It looks like candy. But when you, it's like that game, that game you did with the youth, where you spin the thing, and there's a jelly bean. Well, bing, ben, what's it called? Bean boozle. And it lands on this uh, jelly bean, and then you pick the bean, and you put it in your mouth. It looks good, but it tastes like... I don't want to say in church what it tastes like. So you don't want to play that game. Um, but it looks fun, but then you get into it, and, and, and it destroys your life. That's what sin does. So God wants to protect you. And if, as a parent, if I see a, a child coming to put their fork in, in the plug-in, you're going to jump off the couch, and you're going to pull your child away. But a guardrail is kind of like that little plug, that, that safety plug in there, right? So now you're not tempted as much because there's, there's a protection there. So we have to build guardrails around our life. So I want to say this, the first guardrail definition is a system designed, and this is our last slide, number six, a system designed to keep vehicles from straying into dangerous off-limit areas. And this is the new definition here, is a personal standard of behavior that becomes a matter of conscience. 
a matter of conscience. A personal standard of behavior that becomes a matter of conscience. So uh, honestly, you know, the sitting alone in a car with a, another woman, it's not that I'm attracted to her and I'm thinking that way. It's just I've built this, this personal standard in my life that protects me. My conscience comes on there, not when I've already committed an act of sin. And that's why so many people fall, even in ministries, because they don't set up guardrails in their life to say, I'm going to go this far and no further. For some of you, maybe a guardrail would be, you know, say, hey, I can't have a, outside of work, I won't have a computer in my bedroom. I'll have it in an open space. Like I said before, I won't go into a place where they serve alcohol and sit in that place. Whatever it is, you have to set a guardrail in place so your conscience is triggered before you even get to the sin. Does that make sense to anybody today? And God will help us do that. In the next few weeks, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay? Next week, we're going to talk about why can't we be friends. The week after that, we're going to talk about fleeing sexual sin. And the next week, about true love. Sound good? Awesome. So, Father, I pray, Lord, for every person in this place today. Why don't we stand as we pray? Father, I thank you for every person in this place, Lord, and I've been very transparent with them in one area where I've set up guardrails, and that when we do that, we protect ourselves from the evil one. So, Lord, I pray over the next few weeks that you begin to speak to your people concerning areas where they have to be careful, where they have to set up Um, appropriate areas, personal standards of behavior that become a matter of conscience for them. And I ask, Lord, that you would speak to them and you would direct them because you love them, you love me, you love us. And I thank you that you're going to do that in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. amen.